nine. So this is going to be our last long chapter. Um, chapter 10 is kind of just the wrap up. And this is uh, this ex chapter explains how to get your BC driving license. It also explains the penalties if you break the driving rules and regulations. We're going to read this chapter to learn about the responsibilities involved in getting and keeping your license. So learning to drive. You'll need someone to teach you and supervise your driving practice. This is why one of the restrictions of a learner's license you'll find later in the chapter is the requirement to have a qualified supervisor in the vehicle with you. So choosing your supervisor. You need to choose a supervisor who will be serious about helping you become a skilled and safe driver. Here are some things to consider when choosing your supervisor. Is this person ready to commit the time needed to practice? Um, so as a learner, you're gonna need a lot of practice. Um, depending on what you've done in your past, um, it kind of depends on how good you will be at driving. So for example, if you play a lot of GTA, you're not gonna be great at driving. I'm sorry, you're just not. <laughs> I know this because I suck at GTA <laughs> and um, it's very difficult to drive well there. Um, but if you've driven like, you know, those car racing um, games where you actually have a steering wheel and you actually want to like stay on the road, you could be more prepared. Um, or for example, if you've driven like a quad or a motorcycle or something else like that. So um, we definitely need someone that will be able to commit the time that we need um, in order to become a safe enough driver and a good enough driver to pass your end test which is gonna be your next hurdle on your driving journey. And um, the end test can be quite intimidating just because they are um, going to be looking at absolutely everything that you do. Um, I have a few more recommendations. I'll go over those in chapter 10 just because I think that that's probably gonna be the best place for that. But yeah, basically you wanna pick a driver that's um, a good driver. So someone that you feel comfortable and safe driving with and someone that can give you their time. So, um, yeah, like it says, do we want a good example of safe driving? So can they be relied on to drive while impaired by alcohol, drugs, speed, or take risks on the road? We don't want any of those people teaching us how to drive because um, you definitely want to be able to pass that end test and this person is not gonna be a great example of that. Um, is this person able to get information and ideas across clearly? So if they were to explain something to you, would you understand? Because um, learning to drive, you're going to have to pay attention to what they're telling you and things like that. And if they're not able to get that information across, it's kind of pointless. Um, and then do they have patience to guide you effectively? So I have taught several people how to drive physically, and it does require a lot of patience. Um, just because as an experienced driver, you kind of have to fight the urge to take over or um, sometimes new drivers can do things that seem uh, scary or <laughs> dare I say it stupid. <laughs> so um, yeah, just finding someone that's not going to snap on you because that's going to make your driving experience a lot better. For example, when I was learning to drive, I preferred to drive with my mom over my dad because my dad would get upset a lot faster than my mom. Um, again, you don't want them to be so passive that they say nothing because then you're not learning anything as well. So just finding someone safe that um, is willing to teach you. Professional training. So I, this is actually one of the things I was going to say. I do recommend that you do at least um, two professional driving um, experiences. So some places you either have to book like a whole program to learn how to drive. If you don't have anyone in your life to help you learn how to drive, then that would be a good option. Mind you, it is quite expensive. Um, so what I ended up doing was I kind of took just a couple of driving lessons. So I believe I took one near the beginning of my L, or sorry, my N, after I graduated from my L. And then I took um, a couple right before my test. That can also be helpful because um, some places will loan you their car if you do do lessons with them. So for example, you could do a lesson for an hour, you could loan their car for the end test, and um, there is a bit of a fee for that, but if you don't have a safe vehicle to use for the test, that is a good option. Um, so yeah, it's really good to do professional training because they help you learn faster 
And they're also teaching you the right way. So because it's their job, they are very focused on how to drive properly. Um, for example, maybe your parents or whoever is teaching you hasn't read this book in a very long time. Um, as you will see, I think it was chapter three, which was the signs. I was actually quite surprised by a few of them because I realized that I have been misinterpreting them. That's just because I haven't looked at this book in so long. And the only reason that I am looking at it is <laughs> to kind of read it aloud for whoever is paying attention now. Um, so before taking your end, this could be a good thing to review, um, especially the signs, because those are something that come up a lot in your uh, test, obviously. Um, and you also want to make sure that, you know, they're good at their shoulder checks and different things like that. Again, the 360 um, check isn't something that I typically do mindfully. It's just something I kind of like just do. Um, so, for example, if you're driving with someone like myself who may have forgotten how to do that, that's something you'll want to review. And if you're with a professional driver, um, they're going to be aware of that. They're also probably going to use the same sticky mirror that your instructor would use in the driving test. And also because it's a person that you're not familiar driving with, you're going to be more nervous. I mean, that sounds terrible, but at the same time, it's good because it will prepare you for the test where you're going to be 10 times as nervous. Also, some of these professional driving cars have a secondary steering wheel, um, which can be helpful if you're really not that good at driving when you first begin. Again, don't feel bad at your, about yourself if you aren't very good at driving to begin with. Just be honest with your skill set. So you want to be honest with like your range, like how good at steering you are, how good at stopping you are, how good at parking you are, because those are things that um, will help you be safer. Whereas if you're overconfident, you're going to be less prepared to deal with the reality of things. Um, pretty much everyone starts driving in a parking lot. So that's what you're going to want to do. Go to the mall after they close or go to a nearby park um, after they close or whichever is nearest to your house or more convenient. Usually your parents have a good idea or your whoever's helping teach you has a good idea of where to start. Um, I would recommend doing that before you start with your professional driver, just because you're going to save some money just learning how to control the car by yourself. And then you can go into that driving lesson with more of an idea of what's happening and you'll get more of your money's worth, if that makes sense. So um, here is a program that I'm not quite sure if it's still around. I know back in the day, ICBC had a lot of programs. Um, nowadays, I believe it's more so privatized, but we'll just go through this. Um, oh, I see what it's saying. It's just saying like how the whole ICBC thing works for. So for example, you have your L for a minimum of two, 12 months, sorry, and I think a maximum of two years. The supervisor, whoever you choose, has to be over 25 years old. And you have to always have zero blood alcohol content and zero blood drug concentration. So when you're learning to drive, you obviously don't want to be drinking and driving or doing drugs and driving because that's going to affect your see, think, do abilities. It's also not safe and it's illegal. We're also going to be using no handheld devices or even the hands free because as we discussed in an earlier chapter, it's actually illegal for an L driver to be using any of this. Um, so if you are needing a GPS or something like that, you're going to want to set that before you leave. I'm also going to recommend that you don't use music or try to talk a lot when you have your L. I know it sounds quite sad, but when you're learning to drive, those are just kind of distractions that you don't need to have. Um, even when I'm trying to find a location right now, for example, if I was listening to music or talking to a friend, I would turn down that while I look for something just because your concentration is obviously impacted by the things that you're listening to as well. So just giving your eyes more time to be aware rather than you're using your ears as well. With your L, you do have a two passenger limit. Um, and I believe one of them at least has to be over the age of 25. And you also have restricted hours. So I believe it's only from dawn to dusk that you can drive anyways. Um, so that is actually a lot easier to do just because as I said, driving at night is quite difficult. And there are stiff penalties if you just dis disobey any of these rules. Basically, usually what happens is they'll just take away your L and then you'll have to reapply for it, possibly pay a fine. So yeah, follow the rules, you're learning to drive. That's the whole point of this um, 
section. So basically just learning so that you can drive alone. So for your N, you need to have it for a minimum of two years. So without any driving probation. So that means you also have to drive very safely with your N. You cannot be getting tickets or they will remove your license and you'll have to start back at square one. Again, zero blood and alcohol content um, and zero drug alcohol content. Again, you're wanting to be driving sober just to stay safe and also because that's the legal thing to do. Again, no handheld um, or hands-free devices. You're gonna always want to display your N or your L sign. And your N, you only have one passenger unless it's your immediate family. Um, or unless you're with a supervisor that's over 25, then you can also have more people in the vehicle. Again, stiff penalties. If you get any tickets or disobey the laws, um, they can take away your N, fine you, and you have to start back at square one. This is your uh, class five road test. So this is gonna be much easier than your N road test. Basically this final test is just to make sure that you're a safe driver, you know what's going on, and you're able to control your vehicle. Um, your end test can be quite difficult depending on your instructor and the driving habits that you've developed um, and whether or not you've had any training. So if you have had driver instructor lessons or um, you are quite confident with your driving, that's something to mention to your um, instructor that's uh, grading you for your end test. Just be like, oh yeah, you know, I have taken some um, professional driving lessons. I feel like that's quite prepared me for today. And that's just kind of dropping them an Easter egg that, you know, I am trying. I have done like my best to make it here today. Um, whereas if you've just been driving with family members and you're not that confident, um, that can definitely impact the ability of you getting your N. And each driver instructor is different. They're going to mark you on different things. Uh, they may be harsher or easier than other driver instructors. So you just want to make sure you're quite prepared before you're going for that end test. Um, so yeah, doing that professional driving lesson right before your end test can be quite helpful because again, they'll point out anything that you need to change and um, that's their job. So they're going to teach you to be the safest that they can. So this plan that ICBC has developed, um, I, I don't know if ICBC developed it directly actually because I believe it's a model that's used quite frequently in other countries as well, but it just helps you focus more on driving and you get those extra responsibilities as you gain experience, such as the driving at night um, is gonna come once you be, get your N, for example. So getting your learner's license, um, the first, license new drivers receive is a learner's license. You must be at least 16 years old to apply for your learner's license. You'll also need to pass the knowledge test and pass a vision test and med medical screening. This license is valid for two years and you will need to retake the knowledge test if you want to renew it. To apply, you're gonna go to your nearest licensing office. If you pass the test, you'll be issued a class 7L license, a learner sign, and a copy of tuning up for drivers. Hmm, maybe I should pick up the tuning up for drivers and do that one next because um, I wonder if it's still around. I'm assuming it is. So driving tip, to find your nearest driver's office, go to the driver's licensing section on icbc.com. Remember that there are fees to take each knowledge test and road test, as well as fees to get your photo learner's license and driver's license. You can pay cash, certified check or money order, or nowadays, Visa, debit, <laughs> and MasterCard. Um, so the current fees are shown on icbc.com. Basically what it's saying is you're gonna have to pay to take the test, and then should you pass, you then need to pay for the card, which you carry around with you. So um, it can be quite expensive. Um, I can't remember exactly how much it is for the learners, but it's typically around 50 to $70. And uh, yeah, just look up those fees beforehand. Make sure you have enough money in your account before you head down there. So when you go to the driver's licensing office, you need to take a primary and secondary identification. So there's an ID section that we're gonna cover, I think in the next chapter. Um, if you're under 19, you're also gonna have to bring your parent or a legal guardian. Um, if you're not 
living with a parent or legal guardian, you might be able to pass this, but if you do have someone that's an adult, you may wanna bring them with you just in case. Uh, the fees, so like I said, it's gonna be um, a determined cost that you can find here on icbc.com. And glasses or contact lens if you need them to drive. I know a few friends that have glasses that don't necessarily want a photo with their glasses in the <laughs> on their license, um, but at the same time, of course, you want to be safe. If you need them to drive, you're going to want to bring those with you. The knowledge test. So the test that you're going to take here for your L is a knowledge test that has 50 multiple choice questions that measure how well you know the information in this guide. The test is taken at any of our driver's licensing locations and can be done at a computer terminal. The test is not an open book test and cell phone and electric, electronic devices are not allowed while taking it. In some parts of the province, it's offered in, as a written test. Um, I don't think that's true anymore. I think it's all computerized. Um, however, if you were far up north, possibly. The test is available in English, French, Arabic, Cantonese, Croatian, Farsi, Mandarin, Punjabi, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. You want to make sure that you arrive at the office for at least one hour before cho choosing to take your knowledge test. Um, closing to take your knowledge test. If you have a disability that will make it difficult for you to test, phone the licensing office ahead of time and let them know. Oh, sorry, I was just confused by this. So yeah, you don't want to go near closing. Um, typically, I went like people go for their L in the morning because you're quite excited. Um, so yeah, just don't go before they close because then you may run out of time. If you have a disability, it wants you to call the licensing office and let them know. Um, I have tried this for um, someone that I knew and they were not very helpful. So just be aware that they're probably not going to be very helpful <laughs> um, before you call because I kind of assumed that they would be quite helpful and I was quite disappointed. So we're gonna take the practice test online. I do recommend that you do this. Um, I know some people that didn't even read the book and they just did practice test, practice test, practice test, practice test. Um, that's not the way that I like to do things just because um, you're not typically learning anything. You're learning what's wrong, not what, what's right. So anyone that's actually made it through to chapter nine with myself, congratulations. I'm very proud of you. It has been a long ride. <laughs> um, just by listening to myself and reading this book, I feel that you would be much better prepared. Um, like I said, the first time I took my L, I did fail, but I um, only failed by one question, and I'm confident that if I took it right now today, I would pass for sure. Um, I hope that my commentaries have helped. I try to add extra things just to make things more memorable. <clears throat> because um, I know for myself when I study, I may not remember absolutely everything, but at the same time, I can usually tell what's the wrong answer. And through reading this book, we're really learning how to be slow, safe, think, see, do. So those are just basically what you're gonna need to pass this exam. The practice test is nice because that will kind of show you how the questions were are worded. And I believe probably some of the questions that you would see on the test, you would also have seen on the practice test. Um, so again, that's helpful. And it also gives you the confidence to know whether or not you would be able to pass the test just by taking this practice exam. Be mindful, test one, you're probably not gonna do great. Same with test two or three. Do it five to 10 times, you might be feeling pretty confident. So vision and medical screening. Your vi vision is going to be checked to make sure that you can see enough to drive safely. You will be tested for color vision, depth perception, field of vision, diplopia or double vision, and sharpness of vision. You may need further vision testing by an optometrist or ophthalmologist if you don't pass the vision screening. If you need to wear glasses or contact lens when you drive, this restriction will be shown on your license. So we'll just say on your license, uh, as an aid that you wear glasses. You will also be asked about your medical condition. If there's any question about your ability to drive or if you have a progressive medical condition, you may need to go to a doctor for medical examination. Your doctor's report will be sent to Road Safety BC and the final decision whether to issue you a driver's license will be made there. Of course, you want to be honest with this um, because it is a legal document 
and it is your safety and other safety on the line. So if you do have a medical condition, you definitely want to disclose that. And this vision test is not as scary as it seems. Um, I believe it's just a box that you look into and then you kind of just say things as they're happening and then that, that determines whether or not you pass the vision test. So your learner stage driving restrictions. Um, so we kind of went over this again. We'll just quickly go over it once more. When you're a learner's, when you have a learner's license, you must follow these restrictions. So you must have a qualified supervisor um, to sit beside you while you're driving. Your driver, your supervisor must be 25 or older and hold a valid class one, two, three, four, or five license. So they must have their full license. They can't have their um, N or their L or anything like that, it must be their full license or, you know, like a truck license or taxi license, etc. You they you also must have zero blood alcohol content, so you can't drive after consuming any amount of alcohol. Zero blood drug concentration. You must op must not operate a vehicle while the presence of certain drugs, including cannabis, THC, is in your body. And no handheld or hands-free electronic devices. You must not use these, such as cell phones, music, portable gaming, GPS while driving. You must always have your L sign displayed in your back windshield or on the rear of your vehicle. And you know what? This may seem annoying. It may seem embarrassing, but that just kind of gives um, more experienced drivers the heads up that you are a learner and to be more patient with you as well. And then passenger limit. You're only allowed two passengers in the vehicle, a supervisor and one additional passenger. So only two ever. Restricted driving hours, you may only drive between 5 a.m. and midnight. So a little bit longer than dawn and dusk, um, but kind of just around that area. So getting your novice license, your class seven, you must pass the class seven road test. This assessment um, assesses whether you are competent to drive on your own. By the time you take the class seven road test, you will have had your learner's license for at least one year and you can have that up to two years. So you will have spent many hours practicing with your supervisor. You'll be given um, a driver experience log when you get your light learner's license and use it to register your practice hours. You should get at least 60 hours of practice. This helps develop the skills and experience you need to pass the road test and to build foundations for lifelong safe driving. Um, so when I was learning how to drive, I didn't have a driver's log. This is a good idea just um, so that you know how many hours you've been practicing. Um, but a good way to get that driving in is to ask your mom if you can drive to school in the morning or if you can drive home from school or if you can drive to the grocery store or just different things like that like um, so that you're able to get a lot of driving experience in rather than waiting for driving lessons because um, yeah you basically any driving experience is going to give you better driving experience than not so just jumping at those opportunities and advocating for your own learning. So for the 10 most common reasons a vehicle may not be accepted at a road test, visit icbc.com or refer to taking a road test on the back cover of this guide. Again, I think we'll go over those in the next video, but um, definitely be aware of these because it does happen. If you go into the test and there's something wrong with your vehicle, they will just say, no, your vehicle is not safe to drive and they will not let you take your test and now you're out that money, that time, etc. So again, this is why those um, practice vehicles can be helpful if you do end up taking instructor-led classes. Um, because they'll typically allow you to use their car. Obviously, their car is going to be in safe road conditions. Um, so yeah, we'll go over those in the next chapter. So your class seven road test is conducted by a driver examiner who marks your abilities to drive in a safe, smooth, and controlled manner. The road test takes about 45 minutes. You must provide a safe vehicle to use for your road test. Pets or passengers and other than the examiner or other authorized people are not allowed during your road test. You can prepare for the test using this guide and the, using the tuning up for drivers guide to help you practice. Be, here are some things you can expect during your road test. Okay, so this is good. 
Um, before you start, the examiner checks if you know where the controls are. So they're gonna ask you to turn on your signals, your right and left signals. They're gonna ask you to turn on your high beams and turn off your high beams. Um, how to brake, just so they can see your brake lights turning on. They're gonna wanna make sure that you use your seatbelt, obviously. Um, and then you could just adjust your seat mirrors and head restraints. However, you should already have these adjusted, honestly. Um, so, but checking your mirror is obviously not a bad call because like I said, the instructor, they look for what you're checking and, um, in general, you should always check your mirrors as those are going to be your extra eyes. So using your skills, the class seven test assesses your ability to perform the see, think, do skills, observation, hazard perception, speed control, space man margins, steering and communication. <laughs> So you can see more of these in chapter five. I'm just gonna go into this a bit more. So your instructor is gonna be watching for you to do the intersection checks, etc. So those are always gonna be your left to right. So you're looking at your left, you're looking straight ahead, you're looking to your right. Um, those are gonna be your observation skills. The hazard perception is where your instructor is gonna ask you to pull over to the side of the road and to name all the hazards that you see. Like I said, you want to name as many hazards as you possibly can without sounding um, too nitpicky, but it's better to have more than less. So for example, I can't see well from the stop sign, I'd have to pull out more. There's pedestrians in this area, there's parked cars in this area. Um, this is a populated area, so there could be pets or, an or, pets or children in this area. Um, just looking around and seeing what you see. Uh, you're also going to have to do some um, speed control. So this is kind of how I judge if someone's a good driver is just whether or not when they push on the accelerator, if we jump forward or if we kind of ease into the acceleration. Same with braking. Are we braking slowly and controlled or are we jerking to a stop? Um, and then are you able to maintain that speed? So if you're just driving through town, are you able to stay at the 50 kilometers an hour? Or are you kind of having to push on the brake, the gas, the brake, the gas, the brake? You kind of get the idea. So speed control and just that smooth acceleration, that smooth um, braking, those are gonna be signs of a good driver. Space margins. So that's like how well you stay in your lane. Um, even during turns. So that's something that I got marked on one time was when I was doing a left turn, I guess my instructor did not agree that I was able to keep my space margins all the way through the turn. Um, and I felt that that was quite unfair. <laughs> but space margins is a big thing because sure, can you stay in the lane straight when you're driving in a straight line? But then when you turn, are you still able to stay in that same lane that you're turning into? Um, so then that goes to your steering, right? You want to have smooth and controlled steering. You don't want to overdo it. So recently I was teaching someone to drive and when they were steering, they were kind of going too far and then quickly having to steer back each time. With the automatic and power steering, you actually don't typically have to turn your steering wheel that often. Uh, so just getting to know your car, again, in a parking lot is best because then you can kind of steer around the bends and see how it is. Um, to get a better control of your vehicle. Communication, that's just um, using your horn if you have to, getting eye contact with those other drivers, um, and following the rules of the road. Again, back into chapter five, you can check that out if you're having any issues. Uh, so then they're gonna get you to do these maneuvers. I believe they may get you to do all of these because I am recognizing all of them. So the intersection maneuvers, they're going to get you to drive through. Obviously, we're doing our safety check left to right. We're turning right, so we're going to be shoulder checking over our right before we turn. Uh, we're also going to be stopping before the stop line, wherever that is, at the stop light, at a stop sign, etc., and then turning right when it's safe to go. Turning left, um, so a lot of this is going to be on a left turning light, hopefully. Um, however, say you're in the intersection, uh, already and the light turns yellow, uh, you're going to have to turn left regardless. That's just the rules. You're going to make sure that nobody's running through the light before you turn left. Um, but if you are in that intersection, even during a test, it's automatically assumed that you're going to turn left. You're not going to reverse. 
So just be aware that um, these intersection maneuvers are quite important for your test because that is what we do the majority of driving is going to be driving through right or left through intersections. They're going to get you to test your backing up skills. So this is something you can practice in a parking lot. Um, so you're going to drive to the end of wherever you want to back up from and you're going to make sure that it's a spot where you can see to drive directly backwards because what your instructor is looking for is that you are able to look over your right shoulder and look out through your back window and be able to reverse in a straight line safely controlled and um, again in a straight line you don't want to be curving if you're curving you need to practice more um, because backing up you're typically backing up straight entering traffic so they want to see that you can merge traffic safely so like i said you're going to want to put on your signals um, because that's going to let traffic know to leave you a space and you're also going to want to not be too hesitant. So you will notice other drivers slow down to let you in. If they do do that, you're going to take that opportunity to go because otherwise you're going to be waiting for a while. Um, again, you want it to be safe. You want to be doing those shoulder checks. And during the road test, you do not want to speed up to acceleration because that's considered dangerous driving. If you cannot slowly accelerate into whatever you're doing, you don't want to do it because that is an automatic fail, as the instructor will believe that is unsafe driving because you're speeding up to make that um, enter. They're also going to get you to pull over and stop on the side of the road. So again, using your blinker, starting to slow down and moving to the side of the road when it's safe. Also visualizing where you want to go helps. So for example, if they tell you right about here, you know, you want to slow down and pull to the right, then you're going to look for a spot up here that's safe for you to go to. Because if you just pull immediately to the right, that will not be safe and you won't have time to have done all of those checks that you need to do to pull over safely. Changing lanes. So they're going to want you to change lanes just to see that you can do it. Um, so you're going to put on your signal, wait for a space, move into that lane. You want to do it slowly, but also stay within your space margins in the next lane. Parking on a hill. I believe we went over where to turn your wheels to and um, what to do when you're parking on a hill. So you're going to want to look back at that. Same with starting on a hill. Those are um, important. They'll usually test you on this one, either by parking down or parking up it. Angle parking, um, that is one that I don't think I had to do, but angle parking is pretty basic. Instead of parking straight, you're just gonna be turning into the parking spot a little bit. Parallel parking, 100% this is on the test. Parallel parking is always the bane of everyone's existence. Um, you're gonna wanna practice it in a quiet neighborhood where you're able to pull in, pull out, pull in, pull out. Um, during the test, they don't typically put you in a difficult situation. So usually they'll give you a road that's got um, different cars parked along it and they'll tell you choose a parking spot to parallel park. When I am teaching people how to drive, I always recommend that you work beside just one car and not two, just because you're making your life so much easier. If you have the one car here, that's all you need to help yourself parallel park behind them. Um, however, if you have a car in front of you and a car behind you, now you have to make sure that you're not backing into that car behind you and it just eats your space more so and it's not helpful. So, but you need at least one car to help yourself guide into a parallel park. And also when you're like reverse parking or things like that, it's also helpful to have one car. Again, practice with no cars to begin with, just to make sure that you're able to do it before you step into the car zone just because you don't want to damage your car or anyone else's car. Stall parking. So um, driving forward into a stall and also backing up into a stall are both important because these are both skills that they will test you on. Um, typically they get you to back up into the stall when you arrive back at ICBC. Just depends on your pr instructor um, preference, but you want to be able to back into a stall. Be mindful that when you're doing parallel parking or stall parking, I believe you get three chances. So say you parallel park and you just lightly tap the curb, you're able to readjust from that and um, like park yourself on the curb, but you only get three chances. So um, 
you want to be able to nail it at least one or two because if you're on that third chance depending on your instructor that could look bad for you so two and three point turns again we covered that further um, or earlier in the book that's just kind of like being able to do controlled turns right so safe control typically you're doing this in a neighborhood um, as they are illegal in main roads Merging on and off the highway. So this sounds super scary. If you're thinking highway one, highway three, whatever, that's not what they mean when they say highway. Um, if you're in the lower mainland area near myself, uh, that's gonna be like highway 10 or Fraser Highway. So these are smaller two lane highways um, that are typically a speed limit of 70 or 80. So it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, however, that's definitely something you're gonna wanna practice before you hit your road test. And then they're just going to do general driving. So just all the other time that you're not doing the random stuff above, uh, you're, they're just watching for that smooth acceleration, that smooth braking, driving straight in your lane. Um, typically to drive straight in a lane, it's good just to follow the driver ahead of you um, because you're looking forward in the direction that you're going. Typically the driver ahead of you is staying in the lane properly as well. Um, I think that that's just a driving tip that everybody uses. If the person ahead of you is driving erratically, that's not someone you want to be following regardless, just because they're unpredictable. Um, so if I'm ever behind someone that's not able to keep in their lane, I'm going to go around them and pass them if possible, if it's safe to do so, um, because that's not someone I want to be near if something does go wrong. So getting feedback. If you fail, definitely ask for feedback. If you pass, you can also ask for feedback. And um, you'll notice that the examiner has like this sheet that they'll have marked you on. And they'll mark um, typically, I believe, anything bad that you do. So for example, myself, when I got marked on my left turn, I'm not quite sure what she marked me on. She just marked me with like a one. I never asked for feedback because I did pass that exam. However, if I had failed, I would have asked her like what I could have done better. Um, it may hurt your feelings. <laughs> Asking for feedback can always hurt your feelings, but at the same time, if we don't know what we did wrong, we can't get better. So this is important to do. So um, you may take the test again in 14 days if you don't pass. Be mindful, ICBC always has weights for their um, exams so to rebook that right away to do standby or to keep an eye on the schedule will help you get that test before um, six months <laughs> depending on the wait at the time so here's our novice driving restrictions so when you have your n you may drive unsupervised with the following restrictions so again no alcohol no drugs um, those are just going to affect your perceptions and they're illegal so no handheld, no hands-free devices. Again, just set up that GPS, your music, etc. before you start driving. Again, when you're driving as an N or an L, I don't really recommend that you listen to music too loudly or um, in general, depending on what you're doing or your level of comfort, just because that does distract from your eyes. Your N sign, you must display the official N sign. Um, so when I was an N driver way back in the day, I got multiple tickets and all of my tickets were for not displaying the N sign. So I do recommend that you always display it. You check your car when you go into the mall because sometimes people will take your N sign just for fun and you won't realize it until you're pulled over and then you kind of look like a goof. Um, you can put it in your back windshield. That's probably your safest bet for it not being stolen. Um, I do know that some end drivers remove it themselves if they do have extra passengers in the car just to make themselves less conspicuous. Um, again, just keep your end sign displayed and try to get your full drivers as soon as you can if you feel comfortable doing so and that's just going to prevent a lot of your issues. They have free replacement end signs at any driver's licensing offices. So typically what I do is I keep, well, before I used to keep two ends in my um, side of my car. So if someone was to take my end, I could just display that as well. Um, you can also display a temporary end sign. So you'll see some people that have paper that they've just written an N on themselves in thick letters. That works as well, but it is temporary. You should always have the actual end sign like this that you can get from the ICBC licenses. So then your passenger limit, you're only allowed one passenger in the vehicle with you unless they are your immediate family. So your parents, your brothers, sisters, 
your spouse or your children, grandparents, etc. Um, or if you are accompanied by a supervisor who is 25 or older holding a full license of some sort here, one, two, three, four, or five, then you can have um, unlimited people in the car. Same if you are taking a driver's training and being supervised by a licensed driving training instructor. Um, if you are taking classes with a driving training ins instructor, unless you're very uncomfortable being alone in the car with the instructor, I would recommend it just because like I said, it helps you build up for that anxiety that you're gonna feel during your test as well. And um, it does seem scary, but it's not as scary as your actual test. So it's good just to kind of get your system used to being hyper aware. So the graduating graduated licensing program, GLP penalties. So these are the different penalties that come along. Um, when you're a new driver, your record is closely monitored by the superintendent of motor vehicles. If you get a traffic violation ticket or other driving offense, you could receive a warning letter of probation or prohibition from driving. In addition to the regular driving penalties, there are extra penalties for the GLP drivers. So that's just saying when you have your L or your N, you're at a higher risk for problems just because you are learning and they are making sure that you are learning to be safe. So they're really keeping you under a microscope for those first like three to five years or however long you decide to keep your L and your N. So you may be fined and have penalty points recorded on your driving record if you break any of the learner or novice stage driving restrictions. You may also be fined and have penalty points recorded on your driving record for speeding or other traffic violations. More points or more serious offenses could result in prohibition from driving for one month to a year or more. If you violate the blood alcohol restriction or operate a vehicle while under the influence of drugs, you may receive an immediate roadside suspension or prohibition. These will be recorded on your driving record and you may face further prohibition as a result. If you receive a driving prohibition at, in your learner stage, your learner stage can be extended or will be extended because you will not accumulate any more time towards graduating to the novice stage until you have served your probation and have had your li license reinstated. If you receive a driving prohibition in your novice stage, you'll lose any time you've accumulated towards graduating out of GLP. When your license has been restated following the probation, you will have to accumulate an additional 24 consecutive prohibition free months to be eligible to graduate from GLP. So basically what it is saying is if you have your L and you get a ticket, you're going to restart your L essentially. So say you've been driving for a year, technically you can go for your N, you just haven't scheduled it yet. Guess what? You start back at stage one. Now you have to drive for a full year again before you can start for your L or for your N, sorry. And for your N, if you were, same thing, if you were to get a ticket, they can restart you at the beginning of the N. It just depends how serious your violation is. They could possibly take away your license, like it was saying, and restart you back at the learner stage. Um, here in BC, yeah, it depends on what you've done. I think that they always allow you to continue driving, but other countries can be quite severe. Like for example, I was recently in Brazil, and if you're ever caught drinking and driving, you don't get to dr drive ever again in your life. You just have lost your right to having a license. So it's good to remember that having a license is a privilege. And that's something that we have to be very careful with because a vehicle is essentially a weapon. It's a very large weapon that we need to be able to control safely in order to keep ourselves safe and others. And just remembering that driving is a responsibility, it is a privilege, and it is something that you want to do safely. So um, basically this whole book is what's preparing us for driving. It can seem scary, but if you're aware of what to do in those situations and how to drive safely, then it's it can be quite a safe and um, beneficial thing to have in your life for sure. So fast fact, drivers and learners in BC's graduate licensing program are not permitted to use handheld or hands-free communication devices. For example, cell phones, music, portable gaming devices, GPS systems. If you need to use your cell phone music or GPS, pull over and stop where it's safe. So getting our class five. After you've held your novice license for at least 24 consecutive months without driving probation, you may need to take the class five road test. Passing this 
test means that you exit the G graduated licensing program or GLP and get your full privileged driver's license. For the 10 most common reasons a vehicle may not be accepted for the road test, visit ICBC or refer to taking the test um, section at the back of this guide. So again, because you're taking another road test to get your class five, your car is gonna be under the microscope again. Again, if you don't think that your car is going to pass the driver's uh, or the instructor's um, inspection, you can ask a friend to loan their car, or again, you can ask those driver's licensing um, institutions to practice using their car again that does come with a fee i believe maybe 70 dollars or such but it's worth it if that's what helps you get your license so the class 5 road test requires a higher level of driving skill than the class 7. it gives you the chance to show that you are now a safe experienced driver with excellent vehicle control skills this take test takes about one hour you must provide a safe vehicle to use for your road tests. Pets or passengers other than the examiner or other authorized people are not permitted during your road test. The class five includes the same skills as the class seven, observation, hazard perception, speed control, space margins, steering and communication. At some points during the test, you'll be asked to identify the hazards you see while driving. You will need to look ahead and use your mirrors to identify all the hazards beside, behind, and in front of you. Um, so yeah, just like it said, it's just gonna be like your end test, except it's for your full. As long as you've been driving well and safely for the amount of time that you were in the GLP program, you're gonna find this test super easy. Mine was actually quite short because I guess I was able to demonstrate these skills in a smaller amount of time. Um, and my friend, her one was about 45 minutes. So this hour does sound like it will be quite long. Um, however, again, it's up to your instructor and they're comfortable with your um, driving skills. So they're gonna mark you on the see, think, do skills that you've learned about. And um, so different maneuvers you may need to do. Again, intersection maneuvers, driving through, right, left, lane changes, entering and exiting the highway. Again, this highway is typically the Fraser Highway or number 10 highway. Um, I at no point had to go on a main highway. Three point turns, pulling over and stopping, reverse stall parking. So like I said, they'll test you that on your end as well. General driving in general, hill parking, parallel parking. So again, you can ask for feedback and you'll have to wait 14 test days to take the test a third or a subsequent time. Again, usually there is a longer wait than that, so you're gonna wanna do the standby or um, just watching that schedule to try to get in beforehand. I think we're almost done. I guess not. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a driving tip here. If you aren't familiar with English language driving terms, here are some words to help you practice hazard perception. So a car, a bus, too close, pedestrian, bump, can't see, bicyclist, children, animal, construction, truck, wet road, curve, warning sign, dangerous driver, rough pavement, turning right, hill, pulling out, ice, blind spot, motorcyclist, snow, turning left. If you see a hazard and you don't know the English word for it, you may point at it. So if you're driving in your test, um, you can ask the instructor what it means. You can also um, ask before you start driving in your road test any questions that you may have. Typically, the instructor will say, at this time, you can ask me any questions that you may have. If you don't have any questions, we will begin now. Again, that's your time to ask different questions. For example, when I was taking my road test, I wasn't sure if I should be signaling in a um, road circle just because they were fairly new or a roundabout. Um, so I asked that question before we began. Again, these are also questions that you can ask your driving instructor if you do take those instructor-led courses. Here's some strategies to get ready for the road tests. So we're gonna use that tuning up for drivers. It's designed to help you prepare for road tests, gives a step-by-step -step guide instructions for each of the maneuvers. If you're preparing for a class seven road test, work through the tuning up lessons with your 
supervisor. So again, if you're taking driver instructor courses, or you can go through them with your parents as well. Um, just keep in mind, if it has been some time since they've taken their road test, they may be rusty. You don't require a supervisor when preparing for the class five road test, but it's still a good idea to work with a friend or family member, um, just because then you can get feedback from someone else other than yourself. Again, it's important to be honest with your own skill set, just because you're gonna be better prepared in that way. You wanna practice hazard perceptions by naming the hazards out loud and ask your supervisor to identify any hazards you have missed. Again, that's for preparing you for the test because the instructor, uh, your examiner will ask you to identify the hazards and you do need to be quick on the bite with that. For both road tests, you need to know the signs, signals, rules, and regulations. Review the previous chapters of this guide to make sure you are more familiar with them. Again, like I was saying, knowing the signs, I believe from chapter three is really important because um, those are what you need to follow during your road test. And you can fail if you don't understand, say for example, a park sign or a school sign. And typically road instructors will take you through a school or a park zone just to see if you are reading the signs correctly. You also wanna think about taking driving license lessons. So like we were saying, so there is a choosing a driver driving school section later in this chapter. Um, you can also find them online and just look at the different reviews um, to pick one. Again, some of them can be quite costly. So shopping around may be recommended. Just make sure that you are getting that good instruction for what you're paying. You also want to take plenty of time to practice. So they're recommending at least 60 hours. Um, like I said, grab it where you can take it, but definitely try to get those hours in. Here's uh, what the tuning up for drivers looks like. I'm probably just going to find it online like I did finding this one. However, I'm probably not going to get around to it until the new year, just because my life is a bit chaotic at the moment. So taking a road test, we're going to book our road test and you're going to book it online with ICBC. You can also call in if you'd like, if you're not very computer savvy, or you can ask a friend to help you. So um, in Metro Vancouver, this is the number that you can use. There's also a toll free if you're in a different part of BC. The hours from ICBC are pretty standard business hours. They are open on Saturdays. Um, however, Saturdays are going to be a busy day as well. So if you're able to book it during the week, you might have a better chance of getting in. When you come for your road test, you're going to bring with you that identification. We're going to go over that in the next um, video, but basically just you need um, government identification in order for them to verify that you are who you say you are in order to give you a driver's license. You're also going to need a safe vehicle. So you're going to be looking for those 10 most common reasons that your car would be rejected. You're also going to need, obviously, the vehicle that you're driving to be registered and have insurance papers. Um, you're also going to need a current license. So if you're going in for your N, you're going to need to bring your L license with you. And you're also going to have to bring money for your road test and your license. And if you do need those glasses or contact lens. A driving tip, if you can't keep your road test appointment, you need to notify ICBC. You'll be charged a fee if you don't show up and if you don't provide 48 hours notice or a valid reason. Um, so yeah, just definitely try to make your driver's um, appointment. Otherwise, it looks like you're going to get charged. So uh, let's read the warning first. So warning, make sure the vehicle insurance covers you to drive the vehicle. For example, some insurance categories limit the vehicle to drivers with more than 10 years driving experience. It's your responsibility to ensure that your vehicle is properly insured for use on your road test. ICBC accepts no liability whatsoever for ensuring that your vehicle is properly insured and expresses reserves in its right to make determinations with respect to coverage in the event of a claim. Check with your local auto plan broker if you have any questions about your coverage. If you're planning to rent a vehicle, check with the rental agency to find out if they will allow you to drive their vehicle for your road test. Um, so yeah, make sure that your whoever's car you're driving is registered for you to be driving it as well. Nowadays, ICBC has just recently changed their um, things or their rules around this. Uh, so typically anyone in the household that is gonna be driving the car has to be on the registration. So in that case, you're more than likely on it. Um, however, I know it can raise the insurance and so your parents may not want to put you on it just because it's gonna raise it. You need them to do it 
I'm sorry, that's just the way it is because if there is an accident, you're the driver, you're at fault, et cetera, et cetera, you can be just not covered if you're not on the insurance. And I mean, paying a little bit more over just having to pay the whole thing out of pocket is obviously an advantage. So some strategies for ensuring that your vehicle is safe. You need to provide a safe vehicle that meets the legal requirements and also make sure that you're familiar with the vehicle. So that just means that you've driven the vehicle before, you know how to drive it, you kind of, like each vehicle is gonna kind of have its quirks. So again, braking, acceleration, always gonna be different. Steering, always gonna be different. Just the way the car moves is gonna be different and it's important to be able to feel that in your body kind of thing. Um, so knowing how the vehicle works is obviously gonna benefit you during this test. You also want to be aware if any brake lights, signal lights, or headlights are not working or if they are badly cracked or missing lenses. These lights help you be seen in traffic, so they need to function properly. These are things that they're gonna check um, before you head out of the ICBC licensing thing. So like I was saying, that they're gonna get you to check those um, signals, brake lights, etc. That is one, to see if you know how to do it, and two, to make sure that they're working. So a cracked windshield or illegally tinted windows, it's also going to keep you from taking your test. Um, because you must be able to see outside the windshield. So if it's badly cracked, you won't be able to do that. Tinted windows will also reduce your ability to see other road users. And that will also distract from the eye contact that's so important when you're driving. And so in BC, we're only allowed certain windows and also a certain amount of tinting. Um, so just be aware of that. If your horn is not working, that's also gonna be a problem. I'm pretty sure they get you to honk on the horn as well before you leave, just to make sure it is in fact working. Um, again, your vehicle not being properly licensed or insured. I don't believe that ICBC checks your registration and that's why they're putting so much onus on you to make sure that you are protected under that insurance. Um, so yeah, again, you wanna make sure that you're properly licensed and insured. Um, and yeah, if another option, I guess, for your road test would be to rent a vehicle. I know that sometimes um, places won't rent to you as like a novice driver, but they would probably rent to your parents, for example, but you need to make sure that you are able to drive the vehicle as well. Seat belts not working or frayed. Um, again, cars have improved a lot since back in the day. Um, so they typically do work. <laughs> if you have an older car, you just want to make sure that they are working and they're not frayed. Again, that's your safety, um, but it is also a requirement for the test. Unsafe tires. So we need to make sure the tires are in good condition, have plenty of tread and are properly inflated. So if you've had like a flat tire, you might have what they call a donut or a spare tire. That isn't allowed in the test. You do need to have all of your proper tires there. Um, you also can't have any lights on your dashboard on. So if you notice any check engine, check oil, check brake, check airbag, or any of these lights, they're automatically not going to let you take your test just because that means that you're not possibly taking care of your car or you haven't taken it for maintenance. Um, maybe you have and those lights just stay on, but in that case, you're gonna have to find another car. Your driver's side and passenger side doors or windows are not opening or op operating properly, so they're not opening or closing. Um, again, these are not really things that the driver examiner checks, but say it wasn't working and you guys needed to get out or something, then obviously we're gonna notice. Faulty exhaust. A leaking exhaust pipe or missing muffler is unsafe and dangerous. Excessively loud mufflers are illegal and interfere with conducting your road test. So yeah, everything in your car pretty much just has to be in working order, no lights, no red flags essentially. So unsafe or vehicle modifications. A lot of the time vehicle mods are done in like backyards. So they're typically unsafe <laughs> or illegal. <laughs> uh, so like racing steering wheels, um, they don't typically have airbags. And um, if you're installing it on a car that it's not supposed to be installed on, of course there is a safety concern. Um, excessively raised or lowered vehicles. Um, so if you raise your vehicle, remember that you're raising that center of gravity. You're making your car easier to flip. You have to be aware of that in a car, or sorry, in an examination, they're not gonna allow you to use that. Lower vehicles, um, speed bumps, big killer. <laughs> Can't go over a speed bump. 
Um, so yeah, just don't bring this card to the test. It's obviously not going to pass. And then you also have to fuel up before you go. Maybe something you don't think about, but if you're if you have too little gas in the tank, especially since your test is typically around 45 minutes, you want to have at least half a tank of gas um, to ensure that they allow you to go with that test. Um, otherwise, they're just going to turn you around anyways. You also want to know um, how to use your heater and defroster and windshield wipers because if you go out on a rainy day or a snowy day or something like that, you're going to be able you're going to have to be able to keep your windows clear so that you show good control of your vehicle. You also want to turn off your cell phone and car radio. So in general, I recommend this just as a new driver, but for your test, you actually have to do this. You need to turn off your cell phone and you need to keep your car radio off just because that shows that you are concentrated and you also want to make sure that you're doing those really obnoxious checks like shoulder checks etc i like i mentioned before i know it can feel like you're faking it but it is very important for the test just so that the instructor sees that you're willing to make that um, effort to look around and ensure that you're being a safe driver you also want to clean your car so that Everything is clean, tidy, the lights and the windows are all clean. Um, it's also actually quite dangerous to keep loose objects in your car um, when you're driving. Say, for example, you need to stop suddenly, you have a water bottle in the back seat. It could come and fly and hit you in the head or, you know, fly out the window, etc. So just in general, loose objects aren't typically um, advised. And if you do have, like, for example, your shovel or your snow brush or whatever that you need, you're keeping that in your trunk where you can access it as needed. So choosing a driving school. So you can prepare for the class seven or class five road test by taking lessons from a professional driving instructor. These are, they, there are good reasons for taking driving lessons. Learning to drive skillfully and safely is not easy and qualified instructors are more effective than family members or friends at training new drivers. Again, it's their job. They're, they're supposed to be good at it. That's not saying that your friends or family members suck at driving. It's just saying that they might be rusty. If you're preparing for a class five road test, a professional driving instructor can help you brush up on your skills. When you're choosing your driving school, here are some questions you will want to ask. Is your school licensed? Are the instructors licensed? All driving schools and instructors must be licensed to ICBC and you can ask to see their licenses. You could also, honestly, if you were going to email, for example, a, a driving instructor place or Whichever, you could call them and use these questions or email them, just copy and paste, um, depending on your own comfort levels. You can also ask to see a written policy of the rates, including all charges, hours, number of people in a training vehicle, refunds, and the school must provide this to you. You may also ask, does your school offer an ICBC approved driver education course? Can I see the course outline? Do you use various methods of instructors, for example, one-on-one -on -one or classroom groups? How experienced are their instructors? How much recent training have they had? How do you involve parents, guardians, or adult supervision in new drivers' education? How do you practice car safe? How do you keep your practice cars safe and well maintained? Do you have a vehicle with stranded transmission if I want to learn to drive one? What do I need to know before starting your course? And finally ask the people, have you heard good things about the school? Um, so there's a couple different things I wanna to touch on here. So it is quite important, I would say, to obviously to see their rates, to see their course outline, so how they are going to teach you how to drive. Um, you could ask about experience. I assume that they're not hiring inexperienced instructors, but if you're feeling cautious about that, feel free. Um, how they keep their practice cars safe and maintained? That's a good question to ask because um, you want the car to be safe that you're driving, obviously. Like I said, the tires, the brakes, and things like that are very important when you're driving. So you want to make sure that their cars are um, in good condition, essentially. But this is an interesting one, the standard transmission. Um, I have tried learning standard transmission just with friends and I do not recommend it. Uh, I think it would be, if you were interested in learning standard transmission, this would be the time to do it. Again, I wouldn't do it right away. I would wait until you're quite comfortable driving or even after you're finished um, completing your class seven um, and class five. But it's definitely interesting because 
there are some vehicles that you may have to drive in the future that would be standard or even for example quads are standard so it's just good to know so a driving tip for more information on the advantages of taking driver training visit the driver training and assessment standards website at dtcbc.com and so this actually is a website that has a list of licensed driving schools and locations. Again, um, you can ask if anyone has taken driving lessons and that would be a good way as well. Or on Google, sometimes um, websites and stuff will have reviews. So that's another way to just check out what people are saying about the school. Because essentially, if you're paying that money, you want it to be a good school. Driving tip. Students from outside our province do not need a BC driver's license to drive here if they're attending certain universities, colleges, or other education institutions. Temporary foreign workers with federal work permits designating that they are a seasonal agricultural worker program, SAWP, may drive for up to 12 months on their valid license from their home jurisdiction if they are staying longer than 12 months under SAWP and want to continue driving they will need to get a BC driver's license uh, if you have any questions whether or not your old driver's license is valid you can just call ICBC and check in with them and they will know off the bat um, so some driver training course no sorry some driver training schools offer ICBC approved courses for the new driver in BC's graduate licensing program these schools display a valid driving school license from ICBC with a GLP designation they are also listed in the driver training section here icbc.com slash partners so the ICBC GLP class 7 drivers course feature at least 32 hours of instructor and include classroom and on-road instruction when you successfully complete an approved GLP course while in the GLP learner stage, you are eligible for a six month reduction in the novice stage. As long as you have no violations or at fault crashes during the first 18 months of your novice stage. Um, so basically it's saying if you do attend like a full program under um, one of these ICBC related um, schools, you can knock off about six months. Um, I mean, if you're in a hurry or you just really want to drive on your own that could be a benefit like i said it can cost a lot of money so just be aware of that high school students successfully completing an approved glp course can receive two grade 11 credits by taking their declaration of completion at their secondary school administration office again this book is quite old i'm not sure if this is true still um but somebody to look into if you need extra credits New BC residents, you may use your valid driver's license from another province, state, or country for the first 90 days you live in BC. After this time, you, are BC, you must have a BC driver's license to drive in BC. You will also need to turn in your old license and pass the applicable driver's tests. Um, so depending on where you are, um, I think that you may be able to accelerate your learner process. Um, and just go straight for the N after you pass the L test. But again, that de depends on your um, comfort level and also the restrictions at the time. But you will need to provide proof that you were licensed in another jurisdiction. Your previous driver's license is enough. The class of license you held combined with your driving experience will be used to decide which class of BC license you will be assigned and which tests you need to take. So yeah, like I said, um, depending on what you already have, it may lessen your education here in BC, which would be nice. Um, however, just be aware that ICBC always has a long wait for uh, road tests, and it's best to book the road test for when you think you'll be ready, uh, rather than waiting until you are ready. It's also best to apply for your BC driver's license within the 90 days of moving to BC. New residents that hold a Canadian, American, Australian, Austrian, Dutch, French, German, Japanese, New Zealand, South Korean, Swiss, or United Kingdom license can usually complete their license exchange the same day. For more information, check with the ICB or check with a driver's licensing office or ICBC. Re-examinations. Each year in BC, almost 3,000 people are notified by Road Safety BC to come in for a re-examination. The most common reasons for re-examination are a driver's medical report indicating a health problem, a police report indicating a driver was unsure of how to handle a common driving situation, 
So I did not know this was a thing. Um, so I guess if you really are quite bad at driving or if you have a medical change, then this is something you may be called to do. If the re-examination is for vision screening and signs and signal tests only, you don't need an appointment. If it also includes a road test, you're gonna need to call your local driver's licensing office within 30 days of receiving your notice to book a road test appointment. When you go in for your test, you're gonna have to take in those IDs again, your glasses and contacts, and it's also a good idea to take another driver with you just in case you do not pass, because at that point you won't be able to drive yourself home. Um, prepare for your re-examination by reviewing this guide. Consider taking a refresher course from a driving school to help you brush up on your skills. And you're also going to want to get a copy of the Tuning Up for Drivers, and this will help you practice your driving. Keeping your license up to date. So if you change your, your address, so if you move, you're required to update the address on your license within 10 days of moving. There are three ways to change your address on your driving's license. So you can call the multiple change of address service Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And there's just a few numbers here. Um, you can use the provincial government's multiple address change service web service at addresschange.gov.bc.ca, or you can just go down to the driver licensing office. Um, I would recommend changing it online or just walking in because those seem like the easiest options. Um, I have never used their phone service, but there's like 10 numbers here, so I probably wouldn't. If you have an EDL, you'll need to book an in-person appointment at a driver licensing office to change your address. A fee is charged for the replacement EDL showing your new address. I'm not quite sure what EDL stands for. Hmm. Um, yeah. Typically it's free. You wouldn't need to pay. Um, and I don't see anywhere where it says EDL, so I'm not quite sure what that's talking about. So if your license is lost or damaged, you're going to have to go to a driver licensing office to get your new license. You may have to settle any fines or debts that you owe to the government or to ICBC. Okay, so touching on this, if you owe parking um, tickets to the city or um, if you owe like a fine to the police, what they can actually do is prevent you from getting a new license until you pay off those fines or tickets. Um, so yeah, <laughs> just so you're not surprised. Um, if you've changed your name, you're gonna require legal proof such as a marriage certificate or a change of name and a new photographer may be taken um again if you've changed your name if your license is about to expire or if you lost or damaged your license if your license has expired and you renew within three years of expiry icbc may renew your license without retesting again you're going to have to settle any fines or debts and make sure that you have proper id if your license expired more than three years ago you're going to have to do the whole kick and caboodle again um, however, typically, again, there isn't any like waiting between your L and N. They'll just require the two weeks before you can take your N test. So it's a bit easier, but at the same time, you don't really want to let your license expire if you don't have to. So remember when we were talking about the class one, two, three, four, five? So these are just what that covers. So a class one is semi trailer trucks and other motor vehicles or combination of vehicles except for motorcycles. Class two is going to be buses, including school buses, special activity buses, special vehicles, um, trailers or towed vehicles may not exceed the 4,600 kg limit um, unless they do not have air brakes. And um, they can also drive anything that's in a class four. A class three is a truck with more than two axles, such as a dump truck or a large tow truck, but not including the bus above here that's being used to transport passengers. The trailers may not exceed the 4,600 kgs except for if they do not have air brakes. A tow car towing any vehicle of any weight, a mobile truck crane, any vehicle combination um, from class five right down here. So class four unrestricted buses with a maximum seating of 25 people, including the driver including school buses, special activity, special vehicles, 
um, taxis, limousines, ambulances, or any other motor combination of this class five. So class four, this actually is what you would need if you wanted to drive an Uber or Lyft as well. So typically you need this license to drive taxis, limousines, ambulances, special seating with not with a capacity or less of 10 people and um, any motor vehicle from here, class five again. So class five is our goal here. So that's a two axled vehicle that can be a car, van, truck, or tow truck. Um, sorry, my computer's dying, so I better go to my power source. I think we're almost done this chapter though. Sorry, I'm back. I decided to grab water while I was at it. So yeah, class five is gonna be our um, goal here. So the two axled vehicle, including cars, vans, trucks, and tow trucks. Trailers or towed vehicles may not exceed the 4,600 kgs. Motor homes, including those with more than two axles, limited speed motorcycles. So that just means like a scooter. If you actually want to ride a motorcycle on the road, you're gonna to have to take a separate test. Um, so yeah, this license also includes the ATV vehicles, um, passenger vehicles, but typically if you're driving people that are not part of your family and they are paying, you're gonna need that class four. So um, for example, you could not drive an Uber or Lyft with this one, it's just family or friends. Um, so yeah, you can drive a construction vehicle, utility vehicle, three-wheeled ve three wheeled vehicles. Um, however, it does not include the class four vehicles or the motorcycles, like we were saying. So motorcycles, all-terrain cycles, and all-terrain vehicles, you're gonna need your class six or eight. And you can actually get this a bit earlier as well. So you can get it the same time as you get your L. Um, so you will see some people opting for a motorcycle instead of a car. Um, I don't recommend that, especially as a learner at 16, just because, again, you're not aware of all of the hazards that are around you. And it's just safer to be in a car because there is that protection of the, the roof and the doors, etc. So class four and five with a trailer endorsement, code 20. So trailers or towed vehicles exceeding 46 100 kgs provide neither the truck or trailer has air brakes, any motor vehicle or combination of vehicles in class five. Um, so this isn't gonna be on your test. It's not something you really need to know. It's just for your own personal um, interest, I guess. If you were planning to get like a vehicle or a job as a truck driver, a bus driver, taxi, Lyft, Uber, or if you just want for um, recreational purposes, such as the motorcycle or um, towing your own truck or trailer. So um, drivers in BC graduated licensing program are issued with a class seven and or class eight driver's license. Limited speed motorcycles cannot be operated on a learner's license other than the class six or eight motorcycles learner's license. These are motorcycles, mopeds, and motor scooters with an engine placement of 50 cc's or less 
or less than 1.5 kilowatts of power if other than a piston engine, transmission doesn't require shifting or clutch, maximum speed of 70 kilometers, wheels that are designed to be at least 10 inches in diameter and a dry weight of 95 kgs or less. So basically what it's saying is you can drive a moped or a motor scooter that doesn't go faster than 70 and that's quite light and um, doesn't require any shifting. It's just basically, um, yeah, an electric moped. <laughs> so air brakes, um, these are what you're gonna find on trucks and um, they can be quite difficult to operate. So that's why we're not able to um, maneuver these vehicles unless we have that higher license. And so to operate vehicles with air brakes on a highway, you must have a BC driver's license with an air brake endorsement, the code 15. So restrictions and conditions and endorsements, depending on your fitness and ability, your license may include certain restrictions, conditions, or endorsements. For example, you may need to wear corrective lenses such as eyeglasses or contact lenses while driving. Recreational trailers. For information on towing recreational trailers and getting a house trailer endorsement, see towing recreational trailer on icbc.com. Some responsibilities and penalties. As a license holder, you have a legal responsibility. Having a BC driver's license is a privilege, not a right. You must ensure your vehicle and drive safely to protect you and other road users. Some fast facts here, a class five or seven driver's license permits towing of trailers weighing up to 4,600 kgs. Some recreational trailers exceed this weight. If you want to tow them, you'll either need a class one, two or three driver's license or a four or five driver's license with a heavy trailer endorsement code, such as code 20, or a class four or five license with a house trailer endorsement, which is a code seven. Again, not something you're gonna need to know unless you were wanting to do one of those. Your driver's license, you do wanna carry your driver's license when you're driving. You wanna keep your license current and notify ICBC if you change your name or address. You don't ever lend your license to anyone else. You don't use a license that isn't valid because if your license isn't valid, then your insurance isn't valid either. And you also don't wanna alter your license in any way. So identity theft and driver license fraud. Driver, sorry, identity theft is one of the fastest growing crimes in North America. Identity theft occurs when someone uses your personal information without your knowledge or consent to commit a crime such as fraud or theft. Victims of identity theft suffer financial losses, poor credit ratings, and damaged reputation. A driver's license has become the most universally accepted and trusted form of identification. If your driver's license is stolen, obtained fraudulently, scanned, or faked, it can be used for a tool to commit crime. You can't control whether or not you become a victim of identity theft, but you can take steps to minimize your risk. So protecting you from thought fraud, there's a tough penalty to help protect you from people who commit driver's license and identification card fraud. People who commit these offenses can now face fines between 400 and 20,000, up to six months in prison or both. Offenses covered by the law include making false or misleading statements, failing to disclose required information, presenting a fraudulent record or fraudulently using records to obtain or an attempt to obtain a driver's license or identification card, assisting someone to fraudulently obtain or attempt to obtain a driver's license or identification card in the ways mentioned above, using or possessing a driver's license or identification card that belongs to someone else, allowing someone else to use or possess your driver's license or identification card, using or possessing a fictitious or invalid driver's license or identification card, altering a driver's license or identification card. Basically what this is saying is don't lend your card to anyone for anything and don't borrow anyone's card to drive or to get into bars, etc. It's just not safe and it's also illegal. So some strategies for preventing identity and identity theft and driver's license thought fraud. Sorry, my voice is just starting to lose it because I've been doing this for a while now. <laughs> so um, we're gonna keep our driver's license in a secure place on our person. We're not gonna put it in a large pocket or open purse where it can be easily stolen or fall out. We're also not gonna leave it in plain view inside of our vehicle. We're gonna store our license place our license in a safe place when you're not operating your vehicle. Don't give your license lying around where people can grab it. 
Um, don't share or post photos of your driver's license on social media. Um, so that just goes with anything. You're not going to post a picture of something that's official unless you're covering vital information. Um, for example, do you really want the internet to know your address and to know your height, your weight, your high color, all the things that they need for um, stealing your identity, except especially. So like if you're going to take a picture, just cover the information with your hand or just don't do that at all. Uh, make sure that you get your driver's license back immediately. So if you're giving it um, to someone to verify your identification, just make sure that you're actually getting it back. And um, keep a list of your driver's license and credit cards in a safe place in your home. Uh, so for example, I have a picture of mine on my phone and that's just because if I was to lose my driver's license and I was to get pulled over or need it for something, then at least I do have that photocopy of it. But again, just be aware that your phone is in a safe place either. Um, back in the day, it looks like they used to photocopy them or write down the numbers. That's also an option if you're old school. If you lose your driver's license, you want to report that loss immediately to the police and also to ICBC. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds to report it to the police. You basically just call them, say that you lost your driver's license, give them your name, and then if it comes up, they'll give you a call and return it to you. If you find yourself in the unfortunate position of being a victim of identity theft, in addition to immediately notifying the police, also report the incident to Phone Busters National Call Center. Um, and there's a number here. Again, this book is fairly old. I don't know if this still exists. Um, but if it did, the police would also tell you to do that as well. So warning, a vehicle license plate must carry an unexpired decal to show that it is insured. A driver caught without current insurance can face a larger fine. So yeah, we need to insure our vehicles, obviously. So if, as a driver, you need to ensure that your vehicle has a valid and current license plate as well as adequate insurance. ICBC's basic auto plan coverage ensures that every BC motorist carries a minimum amount of liability insurance as well as insurance to help if they are involved in a motor vehicle crash, including injury or death. This system protects BC British Columbians because virtually all of BC motorcyclists carry at least a minimum amount of insurance. Um, so you may have heard that some places in the US, um, like some states, don't enforce this. So then if there is damage to their vehicle or themselves, they may not be covered. Um, so here in BC, everybody has to have insurance. And I believe ICBC is at the basis of all auto plans, which you will see some people complaining about. Um, but lately they've redone some of their strategies. So that is meant to make it better for everyone, but we'll see. If you're driving your parents' vehicles, your parents may need to adjust their auto plan insurance. Um, the best thing is to have them call and talk to an auto plan broker. Again, you may experience some resistance just because putting you on their insurance may make it more expensive. But like I said, being covered is obviously better than having to pay out of pocket. So a fast fact, any outstanding fines or debts you owe to BC courts, the provincial government or ICBC will be settled before you can get a new driver's license. Unpaid provincial violation tickets or unpaid driver penalty premiums may also affect whether you can buy or renew your auto plan insurance. Um, so just what I was say saying, basically they won't give you your uh, license if you owe them anything. So just be aware that if you do owe them anything, you're gonna have to pay that beforehand. Um, so there's a warning, driving without having a valid driver's or learner's license or without proper license class or driving contrary to licensing restrictions or conditions could breach your national insurance, sorry, could breach your insurance coverage, which means that if you are in a crash, your insurance claim may be denied. You will be responsible for paying the cost of your own injuries or damage you may have caused to your vehicle or to other people or property. So yeah, you need to have that insurance. You need to make sure that it's good for you and you need to make sure that you are driving with a valid license. Some penalties for unsafe driving. You could be fined or prohibited from driving. A prohibition means that it is illegal for you to drive for a specific amount of time. And if you are caught driving while you are prohibited, your vehicle could be impounded and you'll be subjected to fines or jail terms. There is a 250 fee to have your license reinstated after pro prohibition. Um, additionally, if it is impounded, you are looking at usually 500 plus dollars because they'll charge you for the tow truck fee each day that it's impounded. And typically the 
um, restriction will be that it has to be impounded for like say seven days or something so now you're paying for that tow truck the seven days in impoundment then you're paying additionally to have your license reinstated and then typically when you renew your license they'll also charge you that fee again so it actually ends up to be quite a lot of money when you break out the rules um, so it's really just not worth it so in chapter one you were asked to make a number of choices as you drive here are some of the driving fines and penalties you may have received if you made all the wrong choices. So if you speed in a school zone 1 to 20 kilometers over the speed limit, so the speed limit in the school zone is going to be 30 kilometers. So this is saying if you're going 31 to 50 kilometers, you're going to pay a fine of $196 and you're going to get three points on your license. So as a novice driver, you automatically have lost that license and you're going to have to start over because I believe the maximum of points you can have on an N license is the three points. So if you're just speeding in general around town, so during through the town, it would be about 50 kilometers an hour. So if you are going 51 to 70 kilometers, you're going to get a $138 fine and three points. Again, game over. Going through a red light, $167, two points. So you might still survive that one, but it looks bad if you have points on your license as an end driver. So you just want to avoid it altogether. An improper turn at an intersection, I'm going to assume that this means making a U-turn because in BC U-turns are actually illegal unless there is a sign stating that you can do so in that area. So then you're going to get a $109 fine with three points. Passing without a clear view. Um, so this is pretty hard to dictate, but if there was um, like passing on a corner or passing up a hill or somewhere where you wouldn't have a clear view and a policeman saw you, it would be $109 and three points. Failing to yield to pedestrians, like I said, in BC, pedestrians always have the right of way. Um, yes, we do not want to encourage them to cross in a place that is not a crosswalk, but if they are already crossing, you still need to yield to them. Otherwise, you're paying $167 and you're getting three points. And if you're using an electronic device, OK, so this book is a little bit newer than I thought because it's saying effective June 1st, 2016. It's saying $368, but unfortunately that's not actually true. I believe nowadays it's like above $1,000 if you're caught touching your phone. Um, and all of these fines are dependent on your police officer, so they can either increase or decrease these fines as they see fit, um, just based on how you respond to them after you're pulled over. So just a word of word from the wise, <laughs> when you are pulled over, um, try not to admit blame. So if they ask you how fast you're going, say um like do you know how fast you're going you say um yes but then you don't have to say what you're going um for example if they say do you know why i pulled you over you can say no and just see what they say it's basically um how you would handle the situation if you were a child doing something wrong <laughs> you want to try to stay out of trouble right so you're going to be respectful you're going to um try to learn from the situation and just try to work with the police officer. If you're very resistant, you're probably gonna get the highest fine possible. And at the end of the day, that's just gonna ruin your life and not theirs. <laughs> so just be smart. Um, try not to get pulled over, obviously. But if you do, just be respectful and aware of what might have gone wrong there. Um, so the fine includes the 15% victim surcharge levy. Your passenger would also receive a $167 fine if they refuse to wear their seatbelt. And if your passenger is under 16, you would receive the fine. And most fines are reduced by $25 if paid within 30 days. So this is just saying um, that the seatbelt fine is no longer on the driver unless they're a minor. So if they're under 16, then the fine would still go on you. But if, say, if you're driving with your friend, they're refusing to put on their seatbelt, they are going to receive that fine. So that's, again, a way that you can convince them to wear the fine just be like well it's no sweat off my back you're the one that has to pay if we get pulled over and then they're gonna be like oh fine i'll just put it on <laughs> so uh, money can be quite the motivator um but yeah so most fines they do decrease if you pay them within 30 days um something to be mindful of is if you really 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 don't think that you deserve that ticket you can challenge that ticket um, and that's something that you can look into, but most of the time, even with parking tickets, I'm just going to pay it right away because then at least you're getting a discounted price. 
In addition to any fines at the time of your driving offenses, you'll also receive a driver penalty point form from ICBC. The bill is based on the number of points that you've accumulated driving during the year and is issued because people drive with driving offenses are more likely to be involved in a crash. Your 17 points would cost you over $2,500 and your driver penalty point bill. Um, so it's important not to get points on your license because it does increase the price of your insurance. Um, obviously, it means that you've been an unsafe driver as well. But yeah, those points look bad on your insurance. You're going to pay more. You possibly will pay fines. And um, so, yeah, you will pay the driver risk premium if you have one or more criminal code driving con convictions and or 10 point motor vehicle at conviction and or one or more speeding convictions and or two or more roadside suspensions. So, um, yeah, I just recently joined BCAA a couple years ago and that's kind of what they asked, like, have you been in any accidents? Do you have any points on your license? Have you been caught speeding? And those are just different things that they assess um, when they're creating my insurance. Um, uh, what's it called? The insurance price, essentially. So a bad driver record may also in result in driver improvement action, including warning letters, driving prohibitions, and this threshold for intervention is more stringent for drivers in the GLP program. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like we were talking about before, how they can ask you to be reassessed. If you did have many points on your license, that might be something that they'll go into further. So driving tip, for more information on the driver improvement program, pre please read the driver improvement policies and guidelines on the Road Safety BC website. Road Safety BC is responsible for driver improvement programs, even though ICBC carries out some of the administration. Anytime a driving offense is entered on the record, that record is reviewed under guidelines specified by Road Safety BC. Each case is looked at on an individual basis. If the driver continues to drive unsafely and is convicted of more offenses, the driver may get a warning letter that they could lose their driver privileges unless there is improvement. The driver could be placed on probation. If there are any more driving offenses during the probationary period, they may be prohibited from driving for a specific amount of time, such as that one, three, six, one year amount. Um, so just depending on uh, like how many times you've been up put on prohibition, etc. Et if the driver rapidly accumulates offenses, a driving prohibition may be initiated without previous warnings. So yeah, basically just depending on what it is, they're going to control um, your safety because it's road safety BC. I'm just going to scroll ahead and see how much longer is left in this chapter. Oh my god. It feels like it's been going forever. So we have three more pages. Um, so yeah, some penalties for impaired driving. Impaired driving remains one of the major causes of crashes in BC. It kills more than 100 people each year and a thousand more are injured. You risk a lot by driving impaired. There are penalties under the BC Motor Vehicle Act and under the Criminal Code of Canada. Immediate and severe penalties apply if you drive with a certain amount of alcohol or drugs in your system. If you refuse to provide a breath sample. So, um... You may be prohibited if a police officer considers your ability to drive to be affected by drugs or alcohol. If you do not have a BAC level of over 0.8 or a BDC level of 2 nanograms or more of THC. Um, so yeah, if, if a police officer believes that you're impaired and you refuse to blow in the breathalyzer, then you may have severe penalties. Um, again, as a learner and end driver, you're not allowed to have any of these in your system, so um, that shouldn't be a problem providing a breath sample. BC is now tougher drinking and driving laws. You can count on penalties adding up to $600 to $4,000, even if it is the first time you are caught. Um, there's more information here on ICBC.com, but essentially when you're caught drinking and driving, there's a bunch of different things that they've put in place to prevent this. Um, so for example, you um, may have to install a breathalyzer in your car. If you do not have a vehicle, don't think that that's a loophole. They'll get you to install it in your parent's car. And um, this device is quite expensive to put in, as well as they'll make you take classes um, to kind of gauge your, um, I guess, attitude towards the incident. And then additionally, you're gonna be paying fines when you renew your license, and um, you're gonna be paying that driver premium for being a reckless driver, et cetera. 
I mean, take an Uber, call mom, take a taxi. It's just better than endangering yourself, others, and essentially paying all of these penalties. Criminal code penalties. If you're convicted of a criminal code driving offense for impaired driving due to alcohol or drugs, you're looking at some very serious penalties, which could include a lifetime driving prohibition and some time in jail. So again, this is not information that's going to be on your test. It's just information for you to know. Um, and it's kind of information meant to scare you from doing illegal activities. And I mean, if it is scaring you, I guess it's doing its job. Um, yeah, drive safe, don't drink and drive, don't do drugs and drive, and you'll be fine. But um, some extra information here, if it's your first attempt, I think all of this has changed honestly because I know that they keep getting uh, more and more firm with this. Um, but yeah, you can spend pretty much up to 10 years to a lifetime um, either prohibited, fined, or in jail due to different things that you may have done. Um, but yeah, just avoid it altogether. There's other options at the end of the day. You can even walk home or sleep on the side of the road. <laughs> so like, just don't even go into that essentially. Some penalties are strict when you're in GLP if you violate the zero blood alcohol or zero blood drug concentration restriction, you may be subject to various penalties, including immediate roadside suspension, prohibition, a fine, driver penalty points, and or leaving your vehicle impounded. Um, if you are prohibited from driving during the novice stage, you will lose any time you've accumulated. Again, starting back at square one, this means your license um, will be reinstated after prohibition. You'll start the beginning stage and you'll need to be prohibition free for the two years before you're eligible to take the final test to exit the GLP. Um, so fast fact, if you are prohibited from driving during your end stage, you'll lose any time and have to restart. Another one, if you drive while prohibited, you may face significant penalties, including a stiff fine in jail. Well, that makes sense, right? If you don't have a license and you're driving a car, that means that you're uninsured as well. So that's a big no-no here in BC. So other costs, um, besides the penalties listed, you um, money, you will be convicted of impaired driving, cause a crash, your insurance claim could be denied, including claims for damage that you've caused to your vehicle and other people. So again, if you're caught impaired driving, so drinking and driving or doing drugs and driving, ICBC can actually opt not to cover you because you're not following the rules of the road. And as an insurance company, I mean, that's, their easiest option because now all of that is on you. So you would have to pay for any damages that you've done to other vehicles yourself or others um, just because your insurance is now void. Um, again, convictions can prevent you from getting certain jobs. So for example, healthcare or law, law enforcement, etc. Those, this is something that can keep you from doing that. Um, so you definitely don't want to cause unnecessary career damage. Uh, travel. The USA is actually very strict when it comes to different things. So um, if you were caught drinking and driving, that could mean that you could never go to the US again. And that doesn't seem like such a big deal at times because there are other countries in the world. However, other countries in the world may also have this restriction or a lot of flights do go through the USA. And in that case, it would still um, impend your your plans. Essentially, just don't, don't do it. <laughs> Vehicle impoundment. This is just kind of what I was talking about earlier. So if you drive without a license or if you drive when you're suspended or if you ha have been excessively speeding, um, street racing, stunt driving, or allowing a passenger to ride, I'm assuming that means outside the vehicle. So like in a truck bed or something. Uh, the, the police can impound your vehicle for seven days. So that's what I was saying. They can put a restriction on how many days it would be impounded um, and they can even raise that higher. However, you do have to pay for the vehicle towing and the storage. So if it's stored for seven days, each impound has a rate for each day and that can add up quite quickly. So um, it's important for vehicle owners to understand they are responsible for making sure that only licensed drivers use their vehicles. For example, if an employer allows a prohibited or unlicensed driver to use commune, company vehicle, the vehicle will be impounded. Um, so yeah, for yourself, if you have a vehicle, 
make sure that your friends are licensed and also that um, they are put onto your registration if they're going to be driving often because if your vehicle is impounded then depending on how good of a friend they are you possibly would have to pay that regardless driving tip make sure that your vehicle is insured insurance will cover you before you leave canada so if you're traveling um, you want to be aware of the traffic controls that will change if you drive it for here in canada we are obviously right along the u.s border so if you're driving in the u.s there are actually different road rules such as you cannot turn right on a red light and um their speed is in miles instead of kilometers which can also get you into a pickle if you're not paying attention to that um, so yeah there's just different things you'll need to know if you are driving in a different country for example i did drive in new zealand and there they drive on the other side of the road so you just need to be aware of wherever you're going the different speeding and um, road rules that you're going to need to know be a lifelong learner. So some people stop learning as long as soon as they pass their test. And some people may drive the same way that they did when they got their test, um, which again, you learn things as you drive. So it's important to be a lifetime learner and building on those skills that you are learning right now. So um, in your driving career, you may take on additional driving challenges, such as towing a trailer or driving a large recreational vehicle. Um, so that's totally going to change the swing of it. Like I said, with the trailer, it can throw off the balance of your vehicle and it can make it a lot more dangerous if you do not know how to load that trailer. Uh, larger vehicles, always super scary just because the blind spots are bigger and um, it's an unfamiliar vehicle. Again, these are different things. Say, for example, the first time I drove a large recreational vehicle was when I drove a huge moving truck that was 17 feet long. Um, I definitely drove around the parking lot a couple of times just to make sure I got the feel of things. Again, that's something you can do, um, whatever you need to benefit yourself in being a safe driver. Um, and again, if you drive a friend's car or something like that, it's going to be a different vehicle. You're going to need to be able to be quite versatile. So some strategies for sharpening your skills, ask feedback. So ask a friend to watch your driving and give you suggestions for improvement. Know your vehicle, know all the controls, and you can also look at your owner's manual or watch like a YouTube video about your car. You wanna keep up with driving guides, so pick up a copy of the current guide to make sure you're up to date. Um, right now I'm just using the online PDF that I got at ICBC, so that's another option take advanced training. Um, so back in the day, they used to have a defense driving skill course. Uh, they may still have that. That's definitely a good way to practice that think, see, do in a faster um, setting because for myself, it's just been over time. However, the defense driving skills will get you there faster. You also wanna know yourself. Like I said, be aware of your own uh, restrictions. You may be experiencing physical and mental changes that affect your driving and be aware of that condition. If you do have a condition, you wanna have medical, um, regular medical checkups as well. I am also an observer. So if I notice that someone's driving better than me or using a better strategy than I use, um, I will try that because at the end of the day, it's all about your own improvement. Uh, so we are at chapter 10, but this is quite a long video. So I think I'm just going to roll straight into chapter 10 and call it a day um, because I know that this one's quite short. So this is just, more information uh, so licensing information if you're going to call in here is the different numbers you can use there's a greater victoria one and a toll free if you're booking road tests i advise booking them online just because i think it's an easier template however if you're not comfortable or you don't have anyone to help you definitely call by phone um, just be prepared with a calendar because it can get quite overwhelming at times just trying to figure out the different dates and times uh, for more information, so for example, if you're in an accident and you want to report a claim, this again is something you can find on Google. So you could just Google find a claim and you could do that or you could write it down now. Um, but yeah, if you've had a crash with no injuries or you want to report vandalism or theft on your vehicle, you can do that quickly online or by giving them a call. And um, if you're going to buy a used vehicle, you can actually look up any uh, history on that vehicle because a lot of the times you're looking for a vehicle that hasn't been in any accidents. One, for the fact that 
it may not have that like any damage that you have to be concerned about but also just um for your own insurance purposes typically they want it to be a undamaged vehicle and this is always good to know so there's a number here you can call uh, some website addresses here the icbc one justice laws Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, Road Safety BC. Out of these ones, I would say that ICBC and the Road Safety BC are probably your best bets. Um, the rest are, look like they're more for specific, oops, specific concerns. Um, again, Google is everything nowadays. You pretty much Google whatever you wanna know. So I would just do that if it was myself. Um, the internet, you can find out more information on driving. They're just giving you some keywords, safe driving, driver psychology, traffic signs, pedestrian safety, teenagers in driving, bicycle and motorcycle safety, mad rage or <laughs> road rage, uh, trucking safety, driving education, railway safety. Again, these are all things we covered in this book. Um, if you want additional information, for sure use the internet. I noticed on YouTube, there's not actually a lot of resources for learning how to drive, which is why I have done this book. Um, if there's something that you guys like need to know about or think I might be able to help with, you can comment it down below and I'll look into it for sure. Um, but yeah, Google, Google's everything nowadays. Here's a bit of an index. Um, if you want, you can look through the PDF yourself, just if there's anything you wanna touch up on. And it's just on page 161. The PDF is just in my comment um, link below so that you're able to look through this book yourself. Um, or you may have the paper book at home that you meant to read and just never got around to as well. As you'll see, there's a big variety of anything that you could possibly need to know. Um, also, something cool that I know myself, I don't know if you know, if you go control F, you can search pretty much anything you need to know. So for example, if I want to read about U-turns, you can write U-turn. And it's going to show you all of the pages that that appears on, including here. So that can be super useful as well um, if you're looking for something specific. Unfortunately, I brought myself all the way back to the beginning, so let me just go back to the page. All right. So um, about the knowledge test, as mentioned in Chapter 9, your license and knowledge test is taken at any of our driver licensing location it is usually done on a computer terminal. Here are a few helpful things you should know about taking a knowledge test at a computer terminal. So start the test. If the screen is black and it has a floating number, please touch the screen to activate it. I think typically the person that helped you set up the computer would set this up, but just in case, this is just extra things. Skip feature. So this is quite important actually. During the test, you will see an option to skip a question. If you find the question difficult, please hit that skip button because um, like it says here, depending on your score, you may or may not see this question again. Obviously, if you're skipping every second question or whatever, it's gonna pop up again. Um, however, you can skip through the questions up to two times and it's better to answer the questions that you're sure about rather than just winging it on the ones you don't know. So I would actually say that this is um, one of the better options on the test. The status feature. You can always check on the bottom of the screen to see how you, will, how you are doing. Tests will end when you have correctly answered the required amount of questions or exceeded the number of incorrect answers allowed. The test will be complete. So you can always ask the instructor, like, how many am I allowed to get wrong on this test? Again, I wouldn't focus on that because when you focus on failure, that's kind of where you go. Um, like I said, if you've listened to me this far, good for you. Also do those practice tests like I suggested. Um, you should be fine. I wouldn't be concerned. If you um, do need to clarify, you can ask a staff member to better explain a question that you may not understand. They won't give you any hints, but sometimes it helps to hear the question a different way. Um, so yeah, especially if you are someone with a learning disability and you're not understanding the question fully, you may get it wrong just because you didn't understand what the question was asking. Um, like they said earlier, they do offer disability services. Again, I tried to access that myself. It wasn't super helpful. So definitely, if you do have a learning disability, you're going into the branch and they're setting you up on the computer, maybe just let them know that you may need some questions clarified as you do have a bit of a disability. And then they're aware that you may call on them and they won't be as... Um, <laughs> as 
as uh, rude as they could be, I guess I should say. <laughs> after the test, you will be advised whether what to do after you complete the test. So as soon as you finish the test, they'll kind of walk you through the steps. So now we're gonna take your picture for the license. Now here is your N, here is your new book, here is what you need to do. Um, so yeah, they'll walk you through the steps. If you have any questions, this is the time to ask them. It's normal to come in with some anxiety before the knowledge test. Uh, it's produced from the fear of the unknown. Here are some suggestions to help you with reducing your anxiety. So be prepared following a study plan. Spread out the studying materials over a few weeks. Don't try to learn everything the night before. It's natural to panic when you're cramming for a test and there's no substitute for knowing the material. So yeah, just don't take your L test until you're feeling prepared. Um, I typically don't think there's too much of a wait for the L test, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Um, yeah, listen to the videos. If there's something you've forgotten already, go back and review it and um, take some practice tests. You want to study with a purpose in mind. Don't just read the material. Be clear about what you need to know and what information you want to learn in each study session. Highlight key points and write down specific information you may need to recall on a test. So when I study for a test, I always try to take down information that I think that they think will be important. <laughs> so like I was saying, the distinctions between like the class one and class five, etc., aren't gonna be on the test. The question, the stuff about the fines and different things like that, that's not gonna be on the test. But driving, how to drive safely or how to drive in emergencies or those road signs, those are all gonna be very important and that's what you're gonna need to focus on. The rest is more so for your own personal knowledge and driver safety. You also want to get used to the test. Become familiar with the instructions and the format of the questions. Along with reading this guide, keep taking online practice tests as it's one of the best ways to prepare. Although you have some repe repeats, there's almost 200 questions for you to learn. Take several practice tests a day, ideally at the same time of day that you would take the actual test. Review material that you're not completely comfortable with. So this is just testing 101. So it's best to study at the same time that you would take a test. It's best to study under the same circumstances. That's just for better memory recall. That's not for any other specific purpose. So they're just trying to help you with that memory recall. If you're gonna take your test at 8 a.m. in the morning, it's best to do those practice tests at 8 a.m. in the morning because then your mind is gonna, you're gonna kind of see where your mind's at at that time. If you're a morning person, awesome. If you're a night person, you're probably not gonna do great. So keep that in mind when you're booking your test. If you're not a morning person, book it for after lunch. If you are a morning person, book it for first thing. Just be aware of different things like that. Um, same with if you're gonna do your end test. I always kind of be aware of the weather at that time that I'm booking it, and also um, if schools are gonna be in or if it's summer break, just different things like that that's gonna affect your driving and affect uh, the different things that you're gonna need to know. You're gonna wanna get a good sleep before the test. Again, that just helps with memory recall. You wanna arrive early so that you have time to readjust to your surroundings and relax. And then, um, they don't recommend that you cram right before the test because at that point you may confuse yourself more so than help yourself. So you just wanna relax the day of and take that time to study before you arrive at the test um, the day of, right? So if you are anxious throughout the test, you wanna take those deep breaths, hold it for a couple seconds and then exhale. So breathing is how we regulate our system as humans and our stress. So if you are feeling very anxious or very stressed, the easiest and fastest way to regulate that is deep breathing. So you're gonna wanna breathe in for three seconds and then breathe out for three seconds or vice versa. You can do longer, but three seconds is a typical good number for at least trying to regulate that quickly. You wanna read each question slowly and carefully. Do not answer the question until you understand what it is asking. Then you wanna take time to choose the right answer. Um, so yeah, basically sometimes what happens when you're getting near to the end of the test and you're feeling pretty confident, you're just skimming those questions, clicking the answer and going. Well, these questions are meant to, you know, test your ability, test your critical thinking. So there may be a word off or it may like, you know, for example, those questions that add the not, so choose the not right answer. Well, if you just read choose the right answer, well now look, easy peasy, but if you read the question fully you would have read that not and then you would have known that it was a trick question so you just want to be aware of that and take your time with each question 
If you don't pass the test, don't beat yourself up. Everybody has good days and bad days. Like I said, I passed or I fa failed my L the first time. I also failed my N the first time. So it just depends on your anxiety levels, if you're having a good day, a bad day. Um, but just learn from that experience. And remember, anxiety is not something that controls you. You can manage it. You are in the driver's seat. And like I said, deep breaths, rest, relax, and just be prepared is all you can do. So about your road tests, the class five and seven tests are designed to ensure that drivers know and understand the rules of the road and can drive safely on our roads. Before the road tests, the driver examiner will introduce themselves, say a few friendly words. They will then explain what will happen in the road test, including the maneuvers that you will be asked to complete. You will then be given an opportunity to ask any questions. So this is what I'm saying. They'll introduce themselves and then they'll ask you if there's anything you want to ask before they begin. And so then this is your time to ask any questions. You can write them down if you think you're going to be too anxious as well. Um, during the road test, the driver examiner will remain quiet except for to give you directions or notify you of the situation that requires your attention. Ongoing discussion during a road test may distract you. The driver examiner will not try to trick you or ask you to do anything illegal. If you are not clear about directions, please ask the driver examiner for clarification. So just be mindful when you're driving, you'll just be driving and then they'll be like, I want you to turn left at the next intersection. I want you to turn right at the next intersection or um, just certain things like that. That's just how they're going to say the instructions. They're not going to tell you too far ahead of time because they want to see how you react. Um, so just be prepared to either merge into the right, the left, and you're also going to want to do so safely. So just keeping in mind um, your think, see, do and how you're going to do whatever they ask you to do. Again, they're not going to ask you to do something illegal. If the space isn't there or you feel like it's unsafe, you can also say, can I turn at the next one? I feel that this is an unsafe distance for me to move into. Um, that's going to be your best way to get around that. I know it can be scary to merge and change lanes, but that is what they're looking for. And so you do have to be somewhat um, assertive, but at the same time, obviously in a safe manner, because like I said, if you have to accelerate to make a a gap, they're going to fail you on that um, because it is considered unsafe driving if you do have to accelerate into something like that. Um, keep in mind that they're not there to teach you or coach you. They're only there to evaluate you. So you need to come into your road test feeling quite confident of your skills, otherwise um, you may not pass. At the end of the test, the driver examiner will advise you of your road test results and they give further instructions to improve your driving um, so they will give you those results which is that piece of paper that they're marking but depending on your examiner they may not go over them with you because I don't believe mine ever did however if you did fail or you did want feedback that is something that you can ask them to do as it is their job so some tips for passing the class five and seven road tests um, from driver examiners they say keep to the posted speed limits, so don't try to keep up with speeding traffic. Um, so yeah, and typically as a driver, you do want to stay with the flow of traffic. However, when you are in an exam setting, you want to do that 50 kilometers an hour through town or that 70 kilometers when you're outside of town um, or the 30 kilometers in a school or park zone. So, and like I said, speed management is gonna be a big thing here. You're gonna wanna be able to keep pretty much on that line the whole time because that's what they're going to be checking. So definitely practice your speed control before you get to the test. Again, they're going to drive you through a school or a playground zone. So you want to watch for those zones because speeding through them is a common reason for drivers to fail their test. I don't want you guys to think that you can go slower. So if it's a 30 zone, you're going to go 25 to be on a safe side because that can actually fail you as well. They're looking for a controlled, maintained speed. So they want you at that 30. However, you don't wanna go over. So you could go to 29 or 28, but I wouldn't go as low as 25, just because like I said, they're watching to make sure that you're not overcautious or not impulsive. It's just a huge thing. So you wanna stay within a couple kilometers of whatever speed you should be at. You're gonna to wanna to make full stops at stop signs before the stop line. So if there is a white line on the road or just where you would assume the white line would be, you want to stop before that. And then when it's safe, move out, pull out slowly, scan that intersection left to right. 
When turning right, shoulder checks to the right to ensure that there are no cyclists, pedestrians, or other road users in this, and um, therefore in your path. You want a mirror check, signal, shoulder check whenever you change lanes or directions. Again, you're going to want to put that signal on a little bit in advance so that people know to make that space for you. You're going to want to stay in your lane and keep a safe distance from other vehicles. So like we've been saying, that two or three second um, or car length space between you and other vehicles so that you have time to stop if need be. You're going to scan those intersections left to right before driving through, even if the light is green when you approach. Again, people can come out of nowhere and that's also just part of your test. They're making sure that you're being observant. When merging onto the highway, you're gonna use that acceleration lane to get up to speed of highway traffic while remaining within the speed limit. So the rest of the maneuver is a lane change. Um, again, they're not gonna take you on the number one highway. They're gonna take you on Fraser Highway or number 10. Typically there's no speed up options there. So you're just gonna make sure it's safe to go before you start on that. You also wanna practice any maneuvers you may need to do as part of your test, including parallel parking, parking on a hill and two and three point turns. Again, I would just bring the manual with me. That section earlier where there was that big list um, just in chapter nine, I would just practice all of those either with um, someone that you've chosen to be your supervisor or with that driver instructor. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We'll be happy to answer them before you start your road test. Um, I would just say use this with a grain of salt. If you're asking them like five questions before you start your test, I think that that may look bad on you and then they may fail you just for that kind of thing um, because they may feel that you're not a confident or um, well-educated driver. So if you have more than two or three questions, I would make sure that I'm asking those to other people or to a driver and instructor before I start because you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're doing. Identification. So now we're going over that ID that you need to have. So every time you go into the driver's license office, you'll be asked to have one primary piece of ID and one piece of secondary ID. And the table below will show us the most common types of IDs. These are subject to change. You can always go to icbc.com slash accepted ID for a current list of accepted IDs. If this is your first license, you're going to need your Canadian birth certificate or citizenship card with a photo student card and uh, that's usually all the ID you need to bring. Um, I would just bring it all. <laughs> when I went for my first license, there were some issues with my ID. So now when I go, I just bring everything just in case. Um, if you're new to BC, you're gonna want one primary and one second ID from the list below. And remember to bring your non-BC ID. If your name's changed since birth, you're going to um, need to bring that additional information um, as well as all of the name change documentation uh, just in case, right? So a primary piece of ID is gonna be a BC driver's license that hasn't been expired more than three years, a BC ID card, again, can't be expired for more than three years, certificate of Canadian citizenship, Canadian record of landing, secure certificate of Indian status, um, BC services card with photo, standalone or combo, because now you can combo these with your driver's license. Um, BC certificate, sorry, Canadian birth certificate, um, Canadian passport, permanent resident card, student, work, visitor, or temporary resident permit. So this is where I was talking about my kerfuffle. I brought a Canadian passport as my primary ID. However, the person that was helping me at the time told me that was not valid and I had to bring my birth certificate, even though you need your birth certificate to get your passport. So like I said, I just bring it all. A uh, secondary piece of ID can be a bank card, birth certificate from another country, marriage certificate, employee ID card with photo, Nexus card, legal name change certificate, student card or ID, BC services card, Canadian forces ID, credit card, driver's license, health card, native status card, and passport. Um, again, government IDs are gonna be your best bet here. Um, if you really don't have those options, then yeah, for sure, a debit card or a student card, but um, typically I would use probably like a credit card, a BC service card, a status card, a passport, Nexus, um, you're obviously gonna need the name change certificate regardless. So just be aware of what you're bringing. 
If you're born outside of Canada and don't have any of the required primary identification documents, please reach out to Canadian and Immigration at Canada. And this is just this number here, the 1882422100. You also have a vehicle checklist. So we kind of went over this already. Um, we'll just go over to it once more. So the 10 common reasons a vehicle may not be accepted is any dash warning lights um, that affect the safe operation of the car, brake lights, signal lights, or headlights not working or with a badly cracked or missing lens, unsafe tires, doors or windows that aren't operating, cracked or illegally tinted windshield or windows, horn not working, gas tank or electrical charge too low, vehicle not properly licensed or insured, seat belts not working or frayed, unsafe or illegal vehicle modifications. And that brings us to the end. Woo! <laughs> so great job everyone that stuck around for this. I hope that maybe you decide to break it into two because if possible, I would have also done that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think this has pretty much covered everything you need to know. Um, yeah, there's not really anything I can think to add that we haven't already added. Um, good luck and congratulations if you pass the first time. <laughs>